Hey folks, so in this video, you're gonna see me react to some of the supposedly great Ben Shapiro moments, the Ben Shapiro destroys moments. So it begins. Being brave is being yourself and being transgender is, is about the bravest thing you can do. Did but she deserve the award? Yes. Why are we mainstreaming delusion? Uh, it's not delusion. Why, why would you delusion. call it delusion? Because Bruce Caitlyn Jenner, I'll call him Caitlyn Jenner. No, because it's that's her. Gonna... You're not being polite to the pronoun. Because it's disrespectful. It, okay, forget about the disrespect. Facts don't care about your feelings. It turns out that every chromosome, every cell in Caitlyn Jenner's body is male with the exception of some of his sperm cells. You it turns out that his brain cells is male. Wait, I need it to. turns out that he still has all of his male appendages. But How he feels on the inside is irrelevant but to the question of his biological sex. I don't, don't agree with that. I'm not on that train. <laughs> I'm not on that train. <laughs> she, she wants to be called she. I'm going to call her she. So you don't know what you're talking about. You're not educated on genetics. Would you like to discuss the genetics? Or well, well, no, what no, are no. your genetics? I, I, so I'd stay away from the genetics and back to the brain scans. You cut that out now or you'll go home in an ambulance. Yeah, that seems mildly inappropriate for a political discussion. Yeah, th this one was wild. Um, there's a lot to this particular backstory. So, first of all, I was invited on the program, and backstage, the producer says, you know, I used to produce Jerry Springer. This should have been my first hint that things were going to get wild. Uh, and I said, you know, you know my perspective on this. And the person said, right, that's why we're having you on. We want it to be like a lively debate. We want you to just express your opinions and, and, and everything. All right, fine. So then the way they seat this, obviously, is they seat Zoe Turr right next to me, and pretty quickly this thing goes off the rails because the moment that anybody suggests that perhaps a genetic male is actually a genetic male and that a genetic male who believes he is a female is just a delusional male, that this, that, that apparently is, is unsayable. Now, again, that's not to suggest that, that gender dysphoria isn't tragic, it is tragic. But to suggest that a person with gender dysphoria is therefore a member of the sex to which they claim membership is of course absurd on its face. So. As you can see, this debate started to go off the rails even before Zoe Turr decided to get physical in the debate. You can see people saying that I'm being disrespectful to pronouns, which is bizarre because pronouns, aside from facts not having feelings, actually pronouns don't have feelings either, as it turns out. Um, and then the entire movement of the debate away from the realm of the rational toward we're just going to insult people and Zoe Turr suggested, you don't know anything about genetics, little boy, you don't know anything about genetics. And when I asked him about his genetics, that's when the, uh, the physical threat came out. What was funny is right after this, when the rest of the panel immediately swiveled and turned on me, you knew you were going to offend Zoe that way. You knew you were going to offend Zoe. Okay, well, number one, I generally, refer I mean, honest, honest to goodness, I promise you this. I was not thinking in the moment, I'm going to call this person sir in order to insult them. This is a large physical male sitting next to me who's speaking directly to me. And that's just, that's how I speak to men. I mean, this is a man. And, the, and so it sort of came out unconsciously. And then the fact that Zoe Turr got physical about it and started making physically violent threats on the set, that was something I didn't expect to happen. My main reaction there was just puzzlement. I, I honestly could not believe that this was a thing that was happening on national television. It was absolute bizarre world. Uh, after this happened, Zoe Turr, on the way out, kind of growled at me, I'll see you in the parking lot, little boy. And I was like, well, that is a weird take. As my mother later said, as my mother later said, not, not very ladylike behavior. And uh, I said, well, no, I'm not gonna meet you in the parking lot. That's, that's a thing that's not going to happen. Uh, and then later, of course, uh, Zoe Turr threatened to curb stomp me on Twitter, also not super ladylike behavior. And the debate turned into, you're not allowed to use somebody's pronouns when you are, somebody's proper genetic pronouns, when you are talking to them on national TV. Now, as I've said before, if I am in a conversation with somebody at dinner and they're a friend, this is not a public debate, I'll call you whatever you want to be called. I really don't care. But when it comes to having a public debate about whether a male is in fact a male or a female is in fact a female, I'm not going to cede the ground of the argument by going along with the lie that a genetic male is in fact a female. So that, that, that's sort of the, that's sort of the backstory there. What a, what a bizarre moment in time that was, my goodness. Your 
this is pretty famous because obviously I'm flipping off the protesters. I wasn't just flipping them off randomly. What happened is that the, the person who I was flipping off started flipping off the entire crowd as well as me. And so that is a defensive flip off. Han did not fire first in this particular case. So they were, they were flipping me off and I, I flipped them back off. The whole thing was ridiculous. Uh, you had a bunch of protesters, they lined up in front of the stage, they held the thing up for about 15 minutes. We were told that they couldn't be cleared from the room because if the police cleared them from the room, then they would have to clear everyone from the room for some odd reason, which of course is, is silliness. These, these folks also didn't seem to understand that I had chalk and a, and a movable chalkboard behind me. So that allowed me to do the, the little visual sight gag there by writing morons on the board and putting it right above them <laughs> as sort of a placard. But it, it does demonstrate the level of, of debate that's being had on some of these college campuses. I'm not, I'm not sure what shouting safety has to do with anything. Last time someone shouted safety at me, we were in seventh grade and someone had farted, but these kids apparently decided that it was a, a great idea to shout safety as though there was some sort of threat to them with a bunch of police officers in the room and with everybody treating them quite civilly. I remember I actually walked up to the front of the stage. I said to somebody, do you want to have a discussion on this stuff? Like, do you want to, at some point, do you want to actually like talk about this? And the person kind of realized I was talking to them and shook their head, said no. And we, we waited for them to leave and then finally they took off. But again, th this, is, this is not high level debate. And it, it just demonstrates how counterproductive some of these protests are because they got much more attention for the speech by being idiots than they ever would have if they had just ignored it. Were you scared at the time? No, no, this wasn't a scary one. Uh, there, there, are, there are a few of these college speeches that have been scary. This was definitely not a scary one. These, these, I mean, my security was off to the side of the room. There were several cops there. And frankly, this did not look like a particularly threatening group of human beings. Uh, so I, <laughs> I, I, I may not be a jujitsu warrior, but I, I felt confident in my capacity to, to maintain my own physical safety with this particular crowd. And this is how it's written. You won't. And there it is, gang. Guess what? You know what? They're not going to stop us. Yeah. All right. Milana Abdullah's fan, Ruben Martin, wrote, you want I should hoid em, boss. I got a few ideas me and the fellas been kicking around. Only ting is he won't be talking or looking so nice no more. We'll take the cannolis. The reason I'm reading it in this way is because this is exactly how it's written. Hoytum is spelled H-O-I-W-T apostrophe E-M. Speaking of Professor Abdullah, she posted this on her Facebook wall earlier this week. Folks, if you're just joining the live stream, somebody pulled the fire alarm to stop this because this is how the fascists do it. So this one was, was actually the wildest college experience. And this was one of the first ones that sort of led off the entire college tour. It really led off at University of Missouri, but this was shortly thereafter. University of Missouri was 2015. This was what, February 2016, I believe. Uh, and the the students outside who had decided to essentially riot. I mean, they were, they were outside, they were threatening people, they were pushing people around in the crowd. We were told by the police they couldn't guarantee our safety if we left the room. Uh, I had to be escorted in by, uh, by a set of police officers. I had to be escorted out back door by a set of police officers. It was, it was quite amazing. Uh, all of that was because there were professors at the university who were seriously suggesting that I was a white supremacist, like a KKK member, uh, which, is, which is pretty incredible. The students had to be smuggled in two at a time. It was, it, the, the whole thing was just a, a complete bleep show from beginning to end on the part of the university. It ended with a lawsuit, actually. But this is one of the few times where uh, I think I wasn't physically afraid because I had so many police officers around me and I had security, but I was afraid for the other students. Because at one point I said to the students, do you guys want to go out there and we'll have a talk with some of the people outside? And the police were like, no, you don't, no, 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 that, that is a bad idea. And so they said, you know, we can protect you, we can't protect the other students. I said, okay, we'll just wait inside. We literally waited inside until the crowd dissipated. It was pretty incredible. Uh, somebody obviously pulled a fire alarm in there because they wanted to shut down the speech. The speech, by the way, was all about how diversity of thought was important, but diversity of race wasn't particularly important, which I thought was relatively uncontroversial because I'm not sure why skin color should be the be-all, end-all, or even a significant factor in life. But that was, you know, too much for the, for the kids at CSCLA to, to handle, apparently. Do you actually think that Donald Trump colluded yes. with Vladimir Putin? Yes. Do you? You don't? How up. can you not? How you can you not? Okay, so. I do not, because I watched that campaign. I don't think that Donald Trump could collude with his own left foot. 
Well, I don't think he did it, but his, you know, his son did it. His, his, the people who are, who Mueller is And when indicting. the evidence comes out, I'm happy to go for the indictments. I'm fine okay, with the indictments. Great. Okay, great. Criminal okay. activity is criminal activity. But you see That's what, fine. you see but that. But I'm not going to attribute to Trump something he didn't do but where, when he's too ignorant to have done it. Uh, well, he's not too ignorant. He, to, uh, he's to not too me, ignorant is, to be is, a is, criminal, is he, is he a Ben. He's been a criminal his whole life. Okay, but it, We've seen that. Is, Bill. He's, is, he's a scam artist. Is, he's a con artist. I don't know how I turned into the Trump defender here, but is he a doofus or is he an evil genius? you got to pick one. Okay. Uh, actually, you don't. You don't have to pick one. Really? I, look, I'm, I'm not saying he's like Hitler. But hit, <laughs> I am but not. Here is, I, is very... I, but Hitler was crazy, and he was a genius at what he did, which was lie and manipulate people. So you can be both. What was funny about that, the Bill Maher interview is that, first of all, I, I, I enjoy Bill Maher. I think that Bill Maher will say shockingly true things from time to time. I mean, he is, he's definitely uh, down the line lefty on a lot of policy, but not when it comes to things like free speech, um, and the, the willingness to talk with the other side. Like, that, that's stuff that, that Bill Maher is correct about. He, he is po less politically correct than, than a lot of his colleagues. What was weird about this particular episode of Bill Maher is uh, a few things. One, the timing was weird. So I can only do Bill Maher like once a year because they do it live on Friday nights, and that means that I can only do it when Friday night, like Shabbat, comes in very late. So we can basically do it one time a year. So this one time that year, I could only stay for like the first 15 minutes and then I had to run. And we actually negotiated with them that I would do that but not be on the panel. I'd have to take off as soon as I did the, the lead interview. My assumption was, and all the pre-interviews were about free speech, college campuses, ability to talk to one another, and all of the rest. About five minutes before the show happens, his producer comes in and says, you know, Bill really wants to talk about Trump and Russia. And I was like, really? What, wait, why? This, remember, this was in the middle of the Mueller investigation, but nothing had really come out at that point that was supremely damning. I said, we can talk about that, but I'm not sure there's gonna be that much there. It turned into like a 15 minute conversation about Trump and Russia. And so it kind of went in a different direction than I thought it was going to go. But it is it, it, it was demonstrative of one thing, which is that when it comes to President Trump, there are a lot of people who read the headline and they don't read the body of the story. And so they get from the headline, Trump, Russia, collusion, evil, manipulative, election stealing, and then they don't read the story where it turns out that the headline is a, is a vast oversell. And that was really the story of Trump-Russia collusion. It was a vast oversell by the media. It was a vast oversell by the Democrats. Uh, and, uh, and that bled down to people like Bill, I think. I think even the audience started to recognize, you can hear it in some of the clips, that the logic just doesn't hold together. That, that at a certain point, you have to acknowledge that Donald Trump is either a boob or he's a genius. And, and it can't be all of these things. And so when, when you actually say to an audience, people who disagree, listen, we have the same moral standard here. You, you break the law, you go to jail. But I just don't think the evidence is there. It makes it very difficult for people to argue with that point. I mean, we, we agreed on the fundamentals, right? You can even see this. We're agreeing on the fundamentals, which is if you break the law, you go to jail. If somebody colluded to, to steal the election, you go to jail and you shouldn't be president. But I was just saying all you need is the evidence here and, and no evidence was actually presented. Honestly, Pierce, you've kind of been a bully on this issue because what you do, and I've seen it repeatedly on your show, I watch your show, um, and I've seen it repeatedly, what you tend to do is you tend to demonize people who differ from you politically by standing on the graves of the children of Sandy Hook, saying they don't seem to care enough about the dead kids. If they cared more about the dead kids, they would agree with you on policy. I think we can have a rational political conversation about balancing rights and risks and rewards of all of these different policies, but I don't think that what we need to do is demonize people on the other side as, as being unfeeling about, the, about what happened in How San Diego. How dare you accuse me of standing on the graves of the children that died there? How dare you? I've seen you do it repeatedly, Pierce. Like I say, how dare you? Well, I mean, you can keep saying that, but you've done it repeatedly. What you do, and I've seen you do it on, on the program, is you keep saying to folks that if they disagree with you politically, then somehow this is a violation of, of what happened in Sandy Hook. And you have yet, I, I, I really like to hear your policy prescriptions for what we should do about guns. Because I'm you say that you respect the Second Amendment, and you yeah. know, I brought this here for you so that you can read it. It's the Constitution. And I, I would really like for you to explain to me what you would do about guns that would have prevented what happened in Sandy Hook. Okay, so this was this was maybe my first big TV appearance. I, I'd done some TV before this. I'd been on Dennis Miller's show on CNBC before that. Uh, I had done Joe Scarborough's show back when it was called Scarborough Country uh, on MSNBC. That, that was back in 2004. But this was the first one where people really started to take note of, oh, this, this guy is actually fairly good at debating. There, there were a couple things that I had planned. So I had planned right from the outset that I was going to tell him exactly why I thought he was a bully. 
And that's because he had written a column specifically on this topic and because his producers had basically said he's going to bring this up. So I knew I was going to say that. I also knew that at some point I was going to hand him the Constitution because he clearly didn't care about it and really didn't know much about it. Uh, and so that, that was pre-planned. I mean, otherwise, I don't routinely just carry around a pocket Constitution. I have most of it up here. So the interview starts and Peter's opens and he this is not going the way that he thought it was going to go like two nights before he'd had on alex jones and that made bit like a big splash for him because alex jones is nuts and so alex jones had threatened him like if you take my guns i'm gonna come after you with this gun i'm gonna shoot you right that, that kind of thing and that's exactly what piers morgan wanted because he wanted to portray gun ownership advocates as crazy people who are ready and raring to go when it comes to shooting people he has me on i start off i'm being pretty reasonable i think he, he got very offended, obviously, by the fact that I suggested that he was standing on the graves of the kids at Sandy Hook to push a political agenda, but that's pretty much what he was doing. That was his tactic at the time. Uh, and he had actually, there, a little behind the scenes, they, they went to break a little bit early because he didn't really like how it was going. And he brought in a, they wheeled in somebody in a wheelchair who'd actually been a victim of a shooting. And he, I could see, they were getting ready to swivel the camera so that he could say, you know, look at this poor child who was shot it and, and then, you know, are you going to say to this person that you still think that guns ought to be legal? And I had already foreclosed that by saying that he was actively utilizing people who are hurt in shootings or killed in shootings as props for a political agenda, as opposed to having a rational discussion about risks and rewards and benefits of particular gun policies. It, it, took, it took it away from him. The part of this interview that people always forget is the part where he brought out the Sudafed boxes and tried to suggest that it was harder to buy Sudafed than it was to buy a gun, which of course is not <laughs> remotely true. If you buy a gun from a federally licensed firearms dealer, there's in many cases a waiting period. You have to go through a background check. Um, but, but in any case, uh, the, as the interview finishes, I said to him, you know, thanks, Mr. Morgan. That was, that was really great. I really appreciate it. And he kind of snarled at me. He wasn't, wasn't super happy. One of the funniest things about this interview is, of course, the, the afterlife of the interview. So this, this made you know, big waves. It sort of blunted the impact of, he had been gaining some ratings momentum. It wasn't great for a show on CNN. But the, the part that was, that was you know, pretty amazing is that fast forward a few years and, and Piers has been moved, moved on from, from CNN. And now we're pretty friendly. Like Piers, Piers Morgan's actually a really great guy. Like I actually like Piers a lot. I think he's an interesting guy. I think that he has learned some things about the Constitution, or at least how much we value the Constitution here in the United States. Certainly he wasn't, in, in, in the Sunday special I did with him, he wasn't taking the little book and throwing it at me anymore. Uh, so that, that was definitely an upside. Just goes to show you that, um, you know, a lot of the political debate you see on TV is TV, uh, and some of it is real. But if you can see each other as human beings, the likelihood is that more of our conversations would look more like my Sunday special and fewer of them would look like the, the sort of pyrotechnics you saw in this particular episode. All right, folks, well, thanks for watching. If you want to see me react to more of my own greatest moments, all you have to do is leave some comments down below, tell me which videos you'd like to see me comment on, and uh, we'll see you here next time.